It is June 28, 2007. We're here on the campus of Rutgers University in New Brunswick at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. This is another in the series of interviews being conducted for the Rutgers program on the governor for the Brendan T. Byrne archive. This morning we'll be talking with Daniel Gaby, who has been a prominent member of the New Jersey business community, heading his own advertising agency, and is now head of a, a nonprofit in educational reform. Uh, Mr. Gaby has been a longtime friend, associate, and advisor to Governor Brendan T. Byrne. Dan, why don't we start with your recollections of your first meeting with Brendan Byrne? I believe, uh, Don, it was in 1970. In 1968, I was uh, the leader of the McCarthy elected delegates from New Jersey, Eugene McCarthy, the good McCarthy, uh, in uh, Chicago that year. And we were, uh, this is a very strong anti-war movement, and uh, that was when I was beginning in politics. And uh, uh, at the end of that, we formed, after Humphrey won the nomination, and of course, uh, Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated, uh, McCarthy lost, and Humphrey was the nominee. Uh, we formed a, an organization called the New Democratic Coalition in New Jersey to represent the interests of that wing of the party, the liberal wing of the party that had backed McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy and George McGovern, who had just come in to pick up the mantle when Kennedy was shot. And uh, we were trying to find a way to play a role in state politics because we had been advocates of the kind of programs that the, the, the party would not go near at that time. Essentially, we were strong advocates of an income tax which did not exist in the state at that time. We were the, st the state party and politics in general were very corrupt. They needed cleaning up. A uh, whole variety of issues like that that the party didn't want to touch. Big racism problem in the party. You remember the year before we had riots in Newark as a result of that. So uh, <clears throat> at that time, Harrison Williams was a U.S. senator, and uh, unhappily, uh, he's, he's passed now, but unhappily at that time, he was experiencing a serious alcohol problem. It was generally known inside the party, but not widely known outside of it, except that uh, uh, early on that year, he was invited to be the principal speaker at the NAACP convention in Atlantic City, and he arrived there stone drunk, and actually, when he went up to speak at the podium, fell down and outraged the audience, and they passed a resolution condemning his conduct, and it looked like he was in very serious, very serious trouble. And the uh, new, the uh, NDC, as was called, New Democratic Coalition, we decided that uh, we would try to find a candidate to challenge him in the primary who would carry our issues and had a good chance of at least articulating them and raising them to a high level of visibility, if not winning. And we decided that Brendan Byrne was that person. Uh, Brendan Byrne at the time was a uh, Superior Court judge who had had an extraordinary reputation as a crime buster and being incorruptible and so forth. And I called him out of the blue. I didn't know him. And he agreed to have lunch with me, and I laid out the proposal that if he would run, I could assure him at least that part of the party would back, and my guess is that he would get additional support for his effort. He thought about it a while and then called me and said that uh, he would not proceed. He, he sort of declined to do that. And I didn't hear from him any further after that until uh, in 1973. Um, the NDC, uh, in 72, by the way, just to take a step back, I had run for the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate to articulate these same issues and add to that, because it was a, it was a Senate race, I was adding to it a very strong anti-war plank. Nixon had come into office, but was not bringing the war to an end, at least as rapidly as we thought it should happen. This, we're talking about Vietnam now. Obviously, young people think of Iraq, but in those days, people don't remember that, that in Vietnam, we lost almost 60,000 men. I mean, it was a horrendous catastrophe, militarily and otherwise. But anyway, <clears throat> and so in... Uh, Seventy-three, uh, there was a scramble for the nomination because there was uh, there was actually uh, an opportunity for the Democrats to win that. <coughs> Bill Cahill was the governor at that time. He was a Republican, a liberal Republican governor, 
who had gotten himself into problems because of some corruption around him in his administration. And there was a feeling that uh, the Democrats had an opportunity here. In addition to which, Watergate surfaced, and that really created an opportunity and an incentive for everybody to get into this thing. Anyway, there were a variety of, of candidates surfacing, one of whom was a fellow named Dick Coffey, who was then the chairman of Mercer County. He was also a state senator at the time. And we all liked him, and he tended to be supportive of our principles and so forth. And so we all, we being the NDC folks, gathered around his candidacy. And then, uh, almost out of nowhere, uh, Brendan Byrne announces that he's going to run for governor. Now, I talked to him later, and of course he saw this, the opportunity differently at that time than he did when I spoke about challenging Williams, because now Watergate had made this thing very possible. Um, and so he, uh, he declared his candidacy. Coffee realized that against this kind of uh, image and reputation and person, he didn't have a chance. And so Coffee decided to pull out of the race, back burn, and came to us and asked us to go with him. And we agreed to do that because we had already felt a strong uh, sort of sympathy to what Byrne was and what he stood for. Let's go back to 1970, your first contact with uh, Brendan Byrne. Do you recall, since you said you didn't know him at that point or hadn't met him at that point, who were the others suggesting his name? Uh, I don't remember. There was a certain amount. Once, once the, the problem that Williams had surfaced in the media, there was a kind of, uh, well, you know the way it is in politics, Dick. As soon as that's, then, then all kinds of rumors start flying around. One really never knows the origin of them. Uh, reporters pick up stories, they, you know, not for attribution, and pretty soon it becomes an established fact that the man's in trouble and they're looking for alternatives, but you never know quite where that originated. So I, I really couldn't say, I don't remember. Um, the only thing clearly was that of all the names that were surfacing at the time, typically they were political names, which meant that they were part of what it is that we were opposed to. They had their hands dirty in the mess that we were opposed to. And of our view, only Byrne came into this fresh without any of those kinds of entanglements with a clear history of certainly opposing corruption. And my guess is, or at least our guess was, being a, a progressive and being somebody that would be open to the issues we cared about. So he seemed a natural person for us. It didn't go anywhere because, uh, you know, once I made the original contact and he made his evaluation, he, he determined not to proceed, and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. In 1973, um, you didn't try to contact him before you signed on with the coffee campaign about no, his interest? No, we did not. Uh, I took, uh, I had a sense from him that when he called to say he wasn't interested, that he had made a commitment to a career on the bench. And so I kind of took him out of the sort of informal uh, bag of potential candidates for office that we might go back to and sort through and look at. So he, was, he did not surface as, as a name at that time. And we were quite happy with Dick Coffey uh, as an individual. He didn't have Brendan Burns' uh, crime-fighting credentials, corruption-fighting credentials, but he was a good, solid guy, and uh, we were quite pleased to support him. And who of the other Coffey people eventually became players in the Byrne campaign? Well, the, the principal person uh, who was my sidekick at the time, we were kind of partners in all this, was Dick Leone. Uh, and, and my connection with him goes back to 1968, which is another interesting story, because uh, I was one of the few organization Democrats that left the party over Vietnam and went over to McCarthy. And uh, but there was a lot of, of concern about the war and concern about the, the way the party did business all over the country. It's a willingness to live with the racism of the southern delegations. That kind of thing disturbed us terribly. And, uh, but there were a lot of folks who were associated with Dick Hughes, who was then governor, who were in his administration, that were essentially not as free as I was. I mean, you have to remember that I did not have a government position and I was not an official in the party, and I, I made it my business never to be a, a, an official in the party or to have a government position because I felt I wanted to speak out, support who I wished, and not as I wished. And so 
but there was a cadre of people inside the Democratic Party and inside the U.S. administration that was very concerned about the war and very concerned about the other issues we cared about, but had real reservations about Eugene McCarthy. And they had reservations about, for, first of all, whether he could win. Uh, there was a lot of concern about his personality because he was aloof and detached and, and kind of distant. And they, they gathered around Robert Kennedy, who had sort of, uh, after his brother was assassinated, uh, had become the senator from uh, New York. And after uh, McCarthy nearly defeated Johnson in New Hampshire in 68, and drove uh, Johnson out of the, Johnson announced after that, as you recall, that he was not going to seek the nomination for president. He was not going to run for re-election. Humphrey came in, and the forces of what we call the regulars gathered around him all over the country to preserve the status quo and keep the party under their control. Robert Kennedy then announced, because he saw an opening, he announced that he was going to run for presidential nomination. For, and uh, the McCarthy people were outraged by this. They felt that, that their guy had taken the, the hit, had gone through the trouble of, of not the trouble, the risk, uh, the uncertainty of going to New Hampshire against the sitting president had paved the way and that Bobby Kennedy was coming in to pick up the spoils. I didn't feel that way. My view, I, I, I don't take things personally that way. I never did. My view was that, in fact, Kennedy was a strong candidate, that having two people in the race asserting opposition to the war, particularly from different perspectives and different parts of the country and different wings of the party, strengthened us, didn't weaken us, because I was, I was concerned about the issue, the war. I didn't care who the nominee was. And so... Uh, Somehow or another, I don't know how this got back to the Kennedy people, but I had a call from uh, from uh, a fellow named, uh, oh, Lord, he's passed on now. You know him, Jack. Uh, Gleason? Gleason. Jack Gleason. Now, Jack Gleason and I had become kind of friendly in the Hughes administration because I... I worked with the state committee in the legislative races that preceded, that went back to 67 maybe, and I got to know Jack, he was public relations director, but Jack was quietly in the Kennedy group. Jack called me and said that some Kennedy people wanted to talk to me and would I have a meeting? And I said, sure. I think it surprised him that I was willing to do that, but of course I was totally open to it. I was then living in Millstone in Somerset County. I remember this because uh, we were living in a house by the river, and we had a lovely lawn that went down there. And uh, Who shows up at my house but uh, Jack Leeson, of course, Dick Leone, and Gordon McGinnis. Uh, Gordon was someone who uh, Dick uh, met when they were at the Woodrow Wilson School in, at Princeton. And we talked about it, and uh, I told him how I felt about it. I said I had no animus toward their candidate, and in fact was happy... If, you know, if he made it, as long as he stuck to his guns on the war and the other issues. And uh, we agreed to stay in touch. The, the, the hostility, particularly coming from the McCarthy people toward Kennedy, was so hostile that I didn't even dare tell them I was having these conversations. What we agreed to was that if Humphrey could be stopped on the first ballot, then I would work with them and we would make a determination as to which of the two candidates was strongest, Kennedy or McCarthy at that time, that we would work to push our supporters into the other direction if it wasn't our guy. Uh, I had no authority to make that and I said I had no capacity to deliver people, but if that happened, I would do everything I could from my position as a leader to make that happen. And so we stayed in touch. And matter of fact, one of the first fruits of that was that after Kennedy was assassinated, there was a, a major effort made by the McCarthy people to get Kennedy's people around the country behind him, and none of them would do it. The first state that agreed to have a, a, uh, a press conference was, was Dick Leone and myself and McGinnis and some of the other Maca uh, Kennedy leaders had a press conference in which they endorsed McCarthy. Uh, and that was... I think certainly the, re the only reason for that happening is that we talked all that time, we got to know and trust each other, and understood that the mission was more important than the man. And so that's how uh, 
And those are the people that surfaced. The original question was who surfaced around that 73 election. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people that surfaced there were people from the McCarthy and Kennedy camps mm -hmm. uh, in 68. The other thing that connected to the 73 campaign was that after the debacle in 69, Bob Miner was the Democratic nominee. The NDC had put up a candidate. They had packed Henry Krajewski, who was a congressman in Bergen County, for the Democratic nomination. He had been against the war in Congress and so forth. Uh, Miner won that nomination, and I endorsed him because I felt as a Democrat, if we go into primaries, we have to accept and honor the verdict of the electorate and, and back the McCarthy people didn't feel that way. There were a lot of people in it that basically f took the position that they were the only class fit to rule. If their position wasn't honored, they were going to the hell with you. They weren't going to stay in the party. And the NDC broke up over that. Hmm. It never did surface after that. But what happened after Minor was defeated, the, the, the Democratic state chairman, a fellow named Sal Bontempo, who had been in his cabinet earlier when he was governor, when Minor was governor, uh, Sal Bontempo became state chairman. He was seeking a way to uh, pull the party together and bring all of these uh, reformers back into it. Um, and he invited me to lunch and asked me what I thought we ought to do. And I suggested that we have to rebuild the party around issues. They can't do it around the old politics of patronage and power and money and everything else. The people will come back to the party if they believe we stood for something. And the only way to do that is to go back to the, to the electorate, to the rank and file of the party, and ask them how they felt about the issues that were current at the time and develop policies around them that they could support. And so the uh, state committee established something called the Democratic Policy Council, and I was appointed as the first chairman of that council. And I deliberately invited to participate in the council a broad cross-section of people in the party so that we could try to work towards some consensus. It was, it was a tough go because I don't think Bon Tempo or the party were prepared to see the policy council push as hard and as far as we did. And they were left in a very awkward position because they had established us. They couldn't quite reject what we were doing, but they didn't want to embrace it either. And their particular two horrors were um, the state income tax, which we were determined to push. You know, we had a, a horribly regressive taxation system at the time, and it was very important for us to do that. We wanted very strong anti-corruption principles to be installed in the party platform. We wanted very tough measures taken against racism in the party. We wanted open primaries, public funding. I mean, all the things that are taken for granted today were wild in those days. But the, D the Democratic Policy Council pushed them. Um, we also pushed them, as we always did, getting out of Vietnam. And uh, we, we uh, developed a series of papers which we released and distributed to the party, all of this leading up to the 73 election. So when, when Byrne came in and became a candidate, he kind of decided to step in it having no organization, having spent very little time, I think, investigating the issues, having no a substantive policy staff around him. He was just a great candidate and a very smart guy and a very honest guy, but he needed a lot more. And the Democratic Policy Council and the remnants of the NDC gathered around him. He picked up most of the policies of the, new Dem of the Democratic Policy Council became the policies of his administration. If you think about what I just said and think back about Burns legacy, a good deal of that. And we were able to hand them carefully researched, well-documented, substantive papers on each of these issues. And we had some very strong personalities around them, like Leon and others, who were pushing this. And when he came into office, he took a number of people who were on the Policy Council into his administration as cabinet officers. Leon went in as state treasurer. Uh, Joe Hoffman went in as, sec as, as secretary of labor. Uh, Joel Jacobson went in. I can't remember what Joel was doing. Energy. Energy. Uh, and a number of other people who were activists in the Policy Council and in the NDC. It was a time when the liberal wing and reform wing of the party really triumphed, and we began moving. The Byrne administration was our, basically, our, our policies. 
Apart from those you've already mentioned who are active in the NDC and the Policy Council, who are some of the other people who you recall? Gordon McGinnis was active, um, someone very active in, in the NDC and Policy Council, particularly was Lou Caden, who became his, I guess, his general counsel at the time. Lou was very Special close. Special counsel. Special counsel. Lou was very close to the, uh, to the Bobby Kennedy people and very close to us. Uh, trying to think of some others who were in that. Uh, Ann Klein, she went into that administration. She was a part of uh, NDC. Um, but also a candidate on her own. Yes. In 1973. Right. She was a candidate on her own. And she, she felt resentful. She felt she was the legitimate heir of the liberal support in the party. Uh, but of course, this was an interesting liberal wing because in many states, the liberal wing is sort of detached from the reality of politics and begin essentially not melding the two. In other words, it's one thing to advocate programs and policies. It's another to support a candidate who can win and put them into place, even if you don't get everything you want. And we made a judgment that he was most likely to win if we got the nomination. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And, you know, it, uh, it's uh, unfortunate sometimes you have to do that. And in Anne's case, she was, she was very deserving of that nomination. She had worked very hard, and she was a very special person. But in our judgment, uh, what did not have the political strength that burned it. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, Sal Bentempo formed the, Dep the Policy Council as sort of a committee of the, of the state committee? Yes, it was an official uh, entity of the state committee, which shocked a lot of people, and I give him credit for taking the initiative. I don't think he'd have thought about it on his own, and once I raised it, I don't think he had much choice but to at least give it a chance. I don't think they expected us to push as hard as we did or to have a committee. See, what Sal did after having established the committee and appointed me as chair gave me a full range of... Uh, authority to name the members as long as it was reasonably representative of all of the wings of the party. Well, did you at, in fact name some more moderate or conservative members to represent those factions? Oh, yeah. I remember one in particular who, who sort of uh, appointed himself as the defender of the status quo and of the old guard. It was Ralph DeRose, who was a uh, and a very close ally of, of uh, Harry Lerner, who was then the uh, chairman of the Democratic Party in um, Essex County. Uh, I had a long history of battling Lerner, whom I considered quite corrupt, uh, in Essex County. In fact, there's a whole other segment of this story untold about how Peter Shapiro came to be a county executive and Burns' role in that, which is an interesting story. Well, why don't we put that off to a little bit later? Okay. But now, did but Ralph, Ralph DeRose was appointed to the committee, and I think he was appointed at he was one of the few people that uh, that Bon Tempo actually asked me to appoint and did appoint. I did, of course. Uh, first of all, I had no right to say I don't. I want everybody on this to agree with me. And so, uh, secondly, it was a legitimate wing of the party, however much I disagreed with them, and, and they had a right to a place at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a vehement opponent of everything you were trying to do. I'm trying to remember something. You remember, it, it's a very long time ago. You're talking about uh, 73, 72. Yeah, 72, early 72. Um, did, but did they, in fact, object in writing or publicly, or did they They, issue, they issued minority reports. They did. Yeah, they did. I must say they didn't take a lot of trouble with them because they didn't think that we were worth worrying about. Mm -hmm. uh, the big problem they had was that Brendan Burns surfaced was unstoppable under the circumstances because you had Watergate, the, the, the country and the state's aversion, outrage against political corruption was at its height. He was the perfect symbol of, of how one dealt with that and how one uh, cleaned that up. There was no way to stop Brendan Byrne, either from getting the nomination or winning the, uh, the election. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he won it in handsome style because there was a primary in the Republican side. Bill, Bill Cahill, the sitting governor, ran 
for renomination was defeated in his own party for renomination by uh, Sandman, who was a very conservative congressman from Atlantic County. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sandman, by the way, was probably Nixon's last defender on the Judiciary Committee. He was just making a fool of himself. Looking, he said, "There's no smoking gun here." When he talked about Watergate, and uh, Byrne just rolled right over him and pulled in a very strong majority in both houses of the legislature. Well, let's go back a little bit. Uh, I'm interested in how Sa Sal Bontempo reacted when you started coming out with these relatively liberal policy papers from the Policy Council. Well. Did he did he try to rein you in? Yeah. We had a number of conversations, occasionally heated. The problem Sal had was that he thought that I was ambitious enough for a political career that he essentially could blunt this, offer me something, and it would go away. I had no interest in a political career. Did was, he, what did he offer you? Do you remember? Well, he said to me, essentially, I remember having meetings with he and... Uh, and uh, David Willens, who was then the chairman in Middlesex County, and he, a great power. And, and, and essentially, their word was, look, you're, you're obviously a very able, intelligent young man. You have a brilliant future ahead of you in politics. You need the party. You don't want to be making this trouble and making these enemies. Well, I did want to make this trouble, and I did want to make these enemies. I had committed myself to being in politics, but taking no jobs and taking nothing from the party. And uh, supporting those people I thought were good and walking away when I didn't. Um, and there was nothing he could do about that. I didn't want anything. And so he just made a serious mistake putting me in that position. Now, it would have come to nothing, frankly, had there not been a candidacy, Burns candidacy, emerging around which we could gather, which eventually translated into a, an administration that embraced these policies. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. All we knew was that this is what we believed and we were going to stick to it. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the primary. Uh, as you say, Brendan Byrne gets in relatively late uh, for the election. Were there any dissenters? So you mentioned Ann Klein, but any, was there a split within the liberal wing in terms of backing Byrne and Klein or others? No, there was not because there, it was relatively late in the game. There weren't other candidates that were essentially people they could go to that represented a greater fidelity to our issues. Byrne spoke to the, uh, the uh, NDC and the uh, Democratic Policy Council and impressed them. Uh, he, he was candid that he was just getting to learn these issues, but he was perfectly open to the kind of things that we were pursuing. Uh, there, there was no basis for, their, for a groundswell of, of opposition to our support for him that I can remember. And of course, his record at this point is, in terms of policy, somewhat of a blank slate. He's been a prosecutor it's and a totally judge. totally blank. <laughs> so he didn't have anything to undo. Uh, he was very careful in his responses uh, saying that they seemed to make sense to him. It was certainly things that he was concerned about. He was very open. He, didn't, he was not obligated. Not only was his slate blank, but coming in as he did, uh, he really had very few obligations to party bosses, which was very important to us. Uh, we were willing to roll the dice with a guy like that, knowing that at least he was not what we were against, even if he wasn't totally what we were for. But there weren't some people who were concerned about his vagueness or ambiguity about your policy agenda? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were. Do you recall who? Well, uh, there was a small contingent of all of this that really were, was rooted in the peace movement. And these were people who basically were hostile to all politics and all parties. Uh, they were very left-leaning uh, in, in their perception of world affairs and and domestic policy and so forth. And they would never have been satisfied with anyone who, didn't, who wasn't guaranteed to lose. I mean, I, I'm being a little facetious, but they were people who all their lives had been on the losing end of lost causes. And it wasn't that these weren't admirable lost causes, in my opinion. It's just that at the end of the day, uh, I always had the feeling that we did not have a right as people who weren't affected by government policy. Middle class and affluent people are not affected by government policy. 
And so many of them I found offensive because they were perfectly willing to walk away from being engaged in politics because it didn't meet all of their criteria. But in fact, they could afford, they had the luxury of being able to afford to do that because they didn't benefit from government programs. They weren't kept alive by government programs. And so I felt that that was immoral for us not to essentially take a position that was going to pursue winning, not necessarily at all costs or at any cost, but at least winning with candidates where we had a good chance of getting most of what we wanted. You know, I can remember a conversation I had with someone I was trying to persuade to get behind this, and he said, well, burn doesn't meet all of my criteria. And I said, my wife doesn't meet all of my criteria, but we're trying to make a marriage out of it. Well, one of the criteria that he probably didn't meet, and particularly with your experience in advertising and public relations, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, was that he wasn't terribly articulate or charismatic as a candidate or speaker. Did that bother you? No, it didn't. In fact, I frankly it had enough of charisma at the expense of substance, to tell you the truth. I was fine with it. The other thing about it was that <clears throat> I had made it my business always in politics never to get involved in what I practiced professionally, which was advertising, because I had many opportunities to become the advertising agency or the advertising advisor to campaigns. I would never do that for a variety of reasons. But the other thing that that's kind of put me at ease was that Dick Leone had wide contacts around the country in politics. I did not. And there were several advertising advisors who had done some terrific campaigns that he brought into it. So I thought he was well served by those people and I was not concerned. I think typically politics, at least then, was increasingly less a matter of how one interfaced on a personal level with people than how one, how one came across in the media under very tightly managed circumstances. And, and that's what they did. They did a very good job of doing that. I remember they came up with the slogan, the man who couldn't be bought. Uh, you remember that Burns' reputation surfaced when there, uh, some tapes that the FBI had made of a mafia conversation. There was, a, there was a, one of the mafia guys said, well, wh what's the problem? We'll just go and buy off the judge. He said, it's Brendan Byrne. You can't buy him. So obviously they took that and ran with it. At, and it was perfect for the, for the time. Now, I got the impression from what you said before that you were a little surprised when Brendan Byrne announced that he would be a candidate. I was, yeah. Do you recall how you first learned of it? Was it in the newspapers? It was in the, yeah, in the newspapers, yep. And then what did you do? Did you talk to Dick Leone and the other no, people? No, actually, Dick Coffey took the initiative because as soon as it was announced, I think being the savvy politician he was, he knew that essentially he was going to be trying to get the same constituency and that he would never, all he would do was to divide you know, the liberal wing of the party and allow somebody else to get in. And so he made the very pragmatic decision that he was going to drop out. He went to see Byrne and, and <coughs> I don't know the details of that discussion except that Coffee came back, called us together and said that he had had a meeting with Byrne and Byrne uh, was very anxious to have this group and coffee involved, was prepared to give them significant responsibilities in the campaign. Dick was appointed campaign chairman. I was appointed chairman of Citizens for Byrne. The thing you have to remember about my experience with the party was that I had always uh, spent my time in what I was interested in organizing constituent groups, not the party mechanism, not the, uh, the rank and file in the party, and not labor. I'd always had problems with labor, mm -hmm. uh, particularly surfaced in the war when I thought at least the conservative wing of the labor movement, the, the trade, were, were supporting the war and were hostile to what we were doing. So I, I got off on a bad foot with them and frankly never recovered. It was okay with me. But anyway, uh, so the campaign was divided into two parts actually one where uh, the campaign worked with the, with, the, uh, with the party structure, the county chairs, the municipal chairs, the county committee people, and with the union unions and worked that constituency. And then I organized Citizens for Burn, which was 
you know, Peruvians for burn and nurses for burn and God knows what else. That's really what I've always done in, in the campaigns that I've been involved in. Before we go <coughs> further into the campaign, do you recall if anyone tried to argue with Dick Coffey that he should s stick in the race? No one in the meetings I attended, that doesn't mean that individuals didn't call him and try to do that. I, I have no idea, Don. Okay. Well, let's proceed in the primary. Brendan Byrne is a candidate. Dick Coffey drops out, becomes campaign chairman. Dick Leone is the campaign manager. Um, what are your sort of most striking memories of the primary campaign? Well, it struck me it was the first time I had ever been close to a statewide campaign other than the McCarthy effort, which was really an amateur effort. <coughs> Excuse me, there are very few experienced regular Democratic organization people in the, in the peace movement. And so we kind of invented as we went along. I was uh, very impressed with how, how well-oiled and how, how efficient and how... It, it just goes to show you that whether you except the positions that parties take. The parties are experienced in essentially organizing campaigns, getting information out, getting voters out, moving candidates around, uh, controlling the media. I thought that they did that very well. Uh, and of course, Dick, Dick uh, did a brilliant job of, of containing that. And more than that, Dick did a very good job of preserving the ideological uh, commitment that we had gotten from Byrne. He never wavered on that. Now, it was relatively easy for never waver because it was never, the outcome was never in doubt. Uh, you know, the, the electorate was just rushing away from uh, Watergate. You're talking about the general election campaign, but in the primary it was still somewhat of a horse race, wasn't it? Well, yeah, except the, the, when, when Hudson came in behind Byrne, it was all over. It was, forget about it. Now, do you recall any efforts to get Ann Klein out of the race before the primary election? <sighs> Interesting story. <laughs> I, I always I forget these and how that surfaced. About uh, three weeks or a month out, uh, I got a call from Dick Leone. He asked me to come in and see him. When I came in, he closes the door and pulls out of his drawer a... Uh, a uh, poll that they just conducted. And it shows that Ann Klein is doing extremely well in Bergen County, which I suppose one would have anticipated. Uh, Bergen County is very liberal, very sophisticated, a lot of New York transplants there. Um, she was certainly perceived as more ideologically pure than Byrne, et cetera, et cetera. And she was doing quite well there. And Byrne was, uh, the, Leon was concerned about that. <coughs> And he uh, said, the year before, in 72, when I ran for the Senate nomination, I carried every single town in Bergen County in that primary. I think there were 77 towns, blue-collar, liberal, everything. I just swept the whole county, got all 77 to nothing. So he said, you got a lot of friends. I did have a lot of friends. I had an organization up there. I was well re regarded. He said, please take some time to see what you can do about that. So I did. I took some time off from work. I said, who have we got up there? And he said, well, we, the truth is we have almost nobody. So we have a college teacher and his wife and some college kid. That's what we got. So I called this uh, professor. I don't remember his name. I said, meet me at uh, Byrne headquarters. So we met somewhere in Hackensack. There was a storefront, but it was empty. And he was there. And he introduced me to his wife and to the college kid. The college kid who introduced me is Bob Torricelli, who was very active uh, in, in college politics and so forth. Anyway, he said, well, we're going to do the best we can. And we set about in that month or so, and particularly Torricelli, who was an absolute whirlwind. I mean, it's just I was astounded at how... Uh, energetic and uh, committed he was. And we got voter lists, we did mailings, we organized forms. We, he did it, Bob did it. Uh, and while we didn't win, Bergen closed the gap significantly. Uh, about 
as you know, in the, in the way the, the uh, party uh, rules work, uh, the governor appoints a new state chairman. I know it's a couple of weeks after the primary, and uh, state committee people are elected and officers are elected to sort of reconstitute the party. And Dick calls me again. He said, you know, we've got a spot, and I'd like to send a signal that the party is interested in young people. And, uh, and that they have a place in the party, something, somebody could help us with young people. Has you got any ideas? I said, there's a kid up in Bergen County that's phenomenal. I said, get to this kid, you, got to, you should do this, you could bring him in. So Dick called Torricelli, brought him in, he was made sergeant at arms of the Democratic State Committee. I don't know who the hell he could have ousted from anything, but... And then he got a job, part of that was he got a job in uh, the governor's office. And that's really how Bob got started. And we've remained good friends ever since that. Uh, um, but that was, that was one of the byproducts of that primary and of the, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I guess Bob being Bob would have emerged anyway, certainly, because he's just too, he's a force of nature, as you, as you know. But uh, that's how he began. Hmm. Any other primary election and campaign Memories? Not really. It was a fairly smooth, uh, they had very good management. The party was, I mean, the outcome was really never particularly in doubt. And uh, now I, 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 you know, it's, uh, I had very good memories of it. What about primary election night? Were you at the campaign headquarters? Or? No, no. That's funny. I never, once the work was over, I was never interested in uh, the, the festivities or the social side of things. You know, I was twice uh, Jimmy Carter's state chairman when he ran. And both times uh, I, I decided to give my position, my, my delegate seat to another person because it didn't matter to me whether I was a delegate or not. I, I just never, that side of politics never particularly interested me. Well, let's move now to the general election campaign in 1973. Uh, did your role continue as the sort of citizens uh, constituency organizer? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, I'll tell you, the 73 camp general campaign was a walk. Uh, Byrne was endorsed by everybody. Sandman was really uh, so out of step with the electorate generally on policy and had made such a hash of Watergate and his role in it that it was never in doubt. Were you shocked that the Republicans nominated Congressman Sandman? No, I was not. No, I was not. And the reason for it is that for, uh, in 72, the year before, when I ran for the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate, Clifford Case was knocked off in the primary. I know that wasn't the year he was knocked off in the primary. No, he was knocked off six years later. I could see that the conservative wing of the Republican Party was gaining significant influence in primaries. In other words, as you know, the primaries tends to push the the participants that come out from the extreme wings of their party and get active and tend to have a disproportionate influence on the outcome. And it was clear to me that the Republican wing, the conservative wing of the Republican Party was getting stronger and stronger. And so uh, it didn't surprise me that between the, uh, that between the, uh, the Watergate situation uh, and the... Uh, and the, particularly the scandals of the uh, Cahill administration, that that certainly could happen, and obviously did. Now, during the general election campaign, uh, were there people within the Byrne campaign pushing him to adopt more openly the old liberal policy council agenda? No, no. There's a recognition that if you have the right man and you trust him, then, then job one is to get him into office. And if anything impedes that, you're going to compromise and, and allow it to go on the back burner. And that's generally what happened. 
typically in campaigns, the controversial things get put away until later. Uh, and so there was a general acceptance of that. There was a there was a high degree of trust to burn that he was committed on these and was sincere about them. And in fact, it turned out to be the truth. He was and uh, got himself into a lot of trouble being as committed as he was, as you know. And almost wasn't renominated, but um, the fact is that uh, uh, none of those things really surfaced. Well, one of the issues that did surface was the income tax. Uh, he was quoted during the general election campaign somewhat famously as saying that he didn't see the need for a tax quote in the foreseeable future. Did mm -hmm. that create some dissension among the more liberal? No, we were aware of backers? that. We were aware of that in advance of his saying it. You see, th th there's a real interesting uh, uh, observation to be made here because. There's, there's a perception that parties as an institution are very clearly divided between, say, left and right, or even left, center and right. But in fact, it's a spectrum where you have very finite degrees of positions on issues that, that range very widely. And so there were lots and lots of people who could legitimately say they're on the left end of the party who were quite prepared to do what was necessary or practical to get their man in to move their agenda. And he indeed, even when he was in and had legislative difficulties to make the compromises necessary to move it. In other words, there are people who are, who believe that once you start a process, it inexorably moves toward the ideal. And so people say that if you don't demand the ideal immediately, you will never get it. So we had that, those are kind of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. The fact is that the, the, the practical requirements of the campaign ruled, and so there was very little. Uh, occasionally, people would become offended by that and disappear, but it, it didn't matter. I mean, this was, a, this was an army rolling toward the front, and that was going to be. Uh, do you recall any campaign events that you attended where Brendan Byrne was speaking? I almost never went to campaign events. This is my other peculiarity. My, in other words, I would work on them, help prepare them, do whatever materials were necessary, make sure if they were citizen events that they were, there were participants there. But once my job was done, I was never there. I was not interested in sitting on the platform or whatever. Mm. Went well, describe in more detail the nuts and bolts of your job during the general election campaign. Who did you speak to? How did you try to organize? Well, uh, it seemed to me that the best way to approach this problem was to essentially take a look at the range of, of issues that the party platform was dealing with, or at least that I knew he was dealing with, and determine which of those issues were interesting, important to which constituencies, and then go to them, find out, do whatever research is necessary, find out who the leadership was, and ask for an opportunity to speak to them. By the way, it was very easy to get to speak to him because by that time everyone knew Byrne was going to be governor and they were happy to speak to someone from his campaign to make whatever impression they were going to make, to get whatever commitments they were going to get. Uh, and so what, what I would do is talk about, uh, you know, take, uh, no, I don't know, let's pick out something, housing. Uh, we had committed to a substantial expansion of low-income housing. And there were, there were organizations there that represented minority groups and the builders and people like that. And I went to see them and laid out for them the, the, you know, what, what his plans were and asked them to have their organization endorse Burn. That was the principal purpose of the visit. After that, the endorsement was easy because it just meant a, uh, an executive committee meeting and saying, yes, we endorsed the guy. Getting some work out of them, that was a different, tougher job. And it was easier in some cases than another. For example, I'd like them to put out a press release. I'd like them to send a letter or somehow notify all their members that this is the guy we're backing and we have to go out. I'd like them to, to contribute money. I would ask them to contribute workers for election day or at least to get phone banks to get their folks out. That's the day-to-day the -day nuts and bolts stuff. And you were... You were successful to very, very widely varying degrees with each one of these organizations. 
some of them had a passionate interest or need for what was going on and they were well motivated and financed and internally disciplined and they could deliver and some of them were frankly a couple of guys around a table but that was okay you know if they said that they were representing the Austro-Hungarian population of, of New Jersey and we put out a press release nobody questioned whether they really did represent the Austro-Hungarian population of Jersey it was just it was a mosaic that you were building each piece of which contributed to a broad picture of the citizenry rising up and supporting this guy because you remember that parties were held in deep disrepute at the time and so we we tended to down, the campaign tended to quietly do its party work and give much more visibility to even though the party was likely to deliver far more votes they gave much more visibility to the citizen effort uh, in the general election campaign, who were your principal contacts within the Byrne campaign organization? Dick Leone? Uh, I spoke almost always to Dick, yeah. I was quite self-sufficient, frankly, so uh, I didn't take a lot of talking to and uh, just sort of kept them informed. And Everybody made it up, you know, as you go along, you figure out, gee, I got an idea. Uh, maybe the tenants or somebody to talk to or whoever. Now you had mentioned before that you had knocked heads in the past with the Essex County organization. Oh yeah. Harry Lerner. Of course Essex in the primary had its own candidate in Ralph DeRose and did not. No, that was in 77. Ralph DeRose was, was, was contending for the nomination in 77. Um, but was your prominence in the Byrne campaign uh, sort of a sore point with the Essex County organization in terms of their backing of Brendan Byrne, who, who was an Essex native son? They didn't like it. Uh, on the other hand, again, you have to get back to the notion that he was, he was going to be governor, and you basically learn to live with whatever he was going to do unless it was outrageous and I don't think it was outrageous in their minds I was a nuisance I was not a threat um, I don't think I, I I may have been perceived differently I didn't think I was a threat uh, but who knows they could have seen someone who was a nuisance getting into the administration and then becoming a threat so I couldn't tell you Don I don't I don't know but the fact is that I didn't go near them so it, it wasn't as if we were clashing at meetings or anything like that. I had very little to do with them. Um, the, you know, the real, uh, the real problem surfaced in the, uh, in, the re in the re-election campaign when they actually had a candidate and in the Shapiro campaign, because that was for all the marbles. The uh, Essex County electorate had chosen to change their form of government to a strong county executive freeholder uh, form and there was a big battle for who would win that nomination because the nominee was then automatically perceived to win the general election and the organization put up its candidate John Cryan who was the sheriff and uh, I had persuaded Peter to run for that office Peter was a very young man I had helped him win election to the legislature uh, right after Byrne was elected he came in from Harvard and became a uh, he was an aide to Alan Sagner, who was Burns' uh, commissioner of transportation. And Peter came to see me and said he wanted to run for the legislature, and would I help him? And I said, anybody that will challenge Lerner for anything, I will help you. And I did, and he won. Uh, and he became uh, he became an assemblyman from Essex County, and then he began. And then as soon as the uh, voters uh, approved, they. Uh, approved the measure to put the uh, county executive change of government measure on the ballot charter it's called charter change uh, he stepped up and we organized all of the NDC that that group that I spoke about earlier got into the Shapiro campaign and won won the nomination narrowly now Lerner was getting nervous because I was always winning um, so but we, we had we had a lot of trouble well let's backtrack back to 1973 um, Brendan Byrne gets elected fairly easily over Congressman Sandman. What did you think about 
your future role with Brendan Byrne or relationship? Did you expect just to go back to your role as a business executive? No. As a matter of fact, I was quite interested in uh, the position of Commissioner of Community Affairs, mm -hmm. which, as you know, is the branch of government that deals with cities. I'd always focus my interest on cities. I grew up in Newark, went to school there, and was interested in solving urban problems, uh, particularly education, but all of them, generally. And I felt that this was a good opportunity to do that. And so I began to suggest to people around Bern that, that I would be interested in that. Uh, word got out that I was interested in it, and Lerner contacted him. I was living then in Maplewood. Lerner contacted him and said, don't even go near that because uh, if you nominate him, I will ha I will have DeRose or one of our guys exercise senatorial courtesy and it will never happen. And so he, he never proceeded with that. He then appointed a very good uh, commissioner of education. Uh, oh, Lord, my memory is failing me. Uh, she was mayor here in New Brunswick. Pat, Pat Sheehan. Pat Sheehan. Yeah, she was terrific at the job, and certainly I had nothing to complain about in her performance, but I did not. It did not go any further than that. I remember two things about it. One was that he got a call from Lerner, but he also got a call from the chairman in Hudson County, uh, who was the mayor of Bayonne and a state senator. I had had a real ugly tangle with him on the floor of the convention in 68 and he never forgot that and so he made it his business to put a stop to that mayor fitzpatrick fitzpatrick thank you yeah. um do you recall how brendan byrne told you that harry lerner had essentially vetoed your nomination well he actually didn't tell me in so many words but he did tell me that it would never get through the senate and I knew if, it could, if there's only one way to be sure it would never get through the Senate. Is you, that, that we have a very, very nasty practice in the Senate, this senatorial courtesy. It's a really a disgraceful practice, and it still continues to this day. As you. But as the administration does get started, you do begin to take on other assignments. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, why don't we talk about those now? Okay. Um, First thing that happened was when Byrne came in, he uh, recognized, he or some or others in the administration recognized that there was a problem because the state had essentially been letting its infrastructure deteriorate. A whole series of bond issues aimed at rebuilding roads, bridges, tunnels, public buildings, whatever had failed. And uh, I don't know whether it was the result of a study that was done or a poll that was done, but it was then perceived that the reason it was failing was that the electorate had no confidence that it was being done in the context of a broader plan. It was just every time you think of, do you want to build something, you run up and get a bond. Did it make sense, you know, in, in, in terms of a broad long-term plan or not? And so in order to contradict or to counteract that, uh, Byrne set up a capital needs commission. And it was headed by a fellow named McNaughton, who was then the president or CEO of Prudential. And uh, it was uh, structured, it was set up so that the uh, Capital Needs Commission was broken up into different committees, each taking a different section of what might conceive would be an area of capital needs. And I was named to be on the Transportation Committee of the Capital Needs Commission. In fact, it was there that I met Lou Gambaccini in the course of doing that work. Capital Needs Commission uh, put together a really very fine, very comprehensive report. And uh, it was issued, there was a, an effort made to communicate this, and to make a long story short, the, the bond issues passed. And in fact, to this day, I think very few don't pass. I don't know how much of the residue of that study remains in shaping the public's confidence, but the fact is that that, that is the first instance in which I... Uh, Dick called me and then said, you know, we can't go forward with this uh, community affairs thing. Is there anything else you would like to do? And I said, well, truthfully, there's only, the only other thing I'm interested in is education. So uh, 
apparently it was not sufficiently interesting or important or threatening enough for the chairman to actually to veto it and, and, and maybe in fact I often thought he was happy that I was distracted with something like that and maybe leave him alone um, and so I went on and was uh, I'm not sure now whether I was appointed as vice president of the state board or when I went on I was elected by the board I'm not sure what the governor's powers are in that regard. I know he could appoint me. But then I immediately got into two very significant tangles because it was then, this was 1974, maybe. Uh, it was the first uh, equity court decision about the schools. It was then called Robinson versus Cahill and it was the beginning of the court's pressure on the state to begin to equalize funding, particularly with the more affluent, higher spending districts. And I took a strong interest in that, uh, obviously having recognized that the urban districts were underfunded significantly because of the collapse of their property values. Um, and I got a call from Paul Trachtenberg who was, had just formed the Education Law Center at Rutgers and came to see me uh, along with uh, hmm, I think it was someone from the NAACP but I'm not sure and said that uh, they were concerned that as the state moved toward uh, significantly increasing the funding for urban areas that there was no uh, appropriate mechanism in place for accountability for how the money was being spent and what progress was being made with these minority youngsters. And it made perfect sense to me and so I began to argue that the state, in the board meetings, that the state needed minimum competency standards and the basic skills. At that point the state did not actually have states, state tests. Each district ran its own tests and made its own decisions and its own leaving exam and graduation requirements. There were certain courses that had to be given, but basically the, the, the districts, because they spent the money, had to control. State was not nearly in the, uh, you know, in the business of funding as it is today. Uh, and so I was pushing very hard. What I didn't realize was <laughs> that when you start raising accountability in education, it's like in front of the teachers union it's like the sun rising on a vampire. I mean, this, this is, you're horrified by this. And so uh, they came to see me. And thinking I was a dutifully liberal Democrat that I was going to basically go along with the party's obsequience to them. And uh, they said to me that, you know, you can't proceed with this. I said, why not? I said, it makes perfect sense. Why should the taxpayer not have some knowledge of what's happening in the money? Why should we not have some understanding of whether, in fact, what the court has wanted to accomplish is being accomplished? These kids are getting educated. They said, well, and this is really the beginning of my insights into what I really believe today. And I've, I've, I've fought the NJEA from that day to this and will probably die fighting them because I think there are a powerfully toxic force in education in this state. And the reason why these schools are not improving, but we can talk about that some other time. But they said to me, you know, Dan, these children can't pass these tests. And when they don't pass them, they're going to have a terrible sense of themselves. Their self-image is going to be crushed. I said to them, when they go to a apply for a job and they can't fill out the application and they're thrown out of the place, trust me, their self-image is going to be crushed. And I just wouldn't go along with it. And I pushed and I was, it was like, I think there were 13 members of the board when I first raised it. It was 11 to 1 and then it was 8 to 5 or whatever it was. Gradually, I just wouldn't le let go of this and gradually we got minimum competency standards. That was the beginning of the whole state testing programs. Um, so, so that was that was very significant. Um, I think there was one other major issue that we wrestled with on that board. It'll come to me. Um, I stayed there until 19. 
76, when I got a call from Byrne saying that a friend of his was running for president, I thought, what friend of yours is running for president? <laughs> he said, well, he's a governor in Georgia now, but he, he can only, he's not governor anymore. He served one term. I think they have ter a one term limit in Georgia, or at least they did then. And he's running for president. He said, and he called me and he said, you know, he's looking for somebody to be his guy here and lead the campaign. I thought to myself, you got to be kidding. I'm going to back a Georgia governor because I just had this, you know, to my great shame, I, I, I had this kind of cartoon view of Southerners. He said, no, no, he's not like that. He's not like that. He said, you should, uh, you should talk to him. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it, you know. Now, the governor says, think about it, at least you think about it. And I thought about it, and I, and, and I talked to him. And I read his positions, and I talked to people who knew him, and I finally thought, you know, Adon, he is, he is to this day one of the most intelligent men. I was blown away by how smart he was. The other thing that was important to me was that he was then articulating the urgency of the party moving away from the left and moving toward a recognition that there were working people in the party, family people who had different kinds of values, and that the party was going overboard in recognizing the extremes, social extremes and things like that. That's not that we should be supportive of them and recognize their legitimacy, but he was abandoning the blue collar people in the party. And, and we were handing him up to George Wallace at the time in droves because they believed the Democrats didn't care about them. And this really bothered me terribly, not the least of which because I'm from a family like that. And I know my parents are decent, caring people, but they, they, they were also one paycheck away from oblivion. And there were millions of Americans like that. And Carter seemed to recognize, he seemed to recognize that we had to reform the party nationwide, that we had to have a humanitarian international policy. These things appealed to me. And essentially, uh, so to make a long story short, I, I signed on this as first as a state chairman, and we began to organize here for him. I resigned from the state board. I felt it was inappropriate to, to do both, nor did I have the time to do both seriously. Well, let me stop you before you, we go further into the Carter campaign and get you back to 1974. Well, that's your job, Don, mm -hmm. to keep pulling me back. Um, 74? 74. Uh -huh. Brenda the beginning Burns, of the Burns of Brenda Burns' first year in right. office. Now, you're um, in a role that puts you in the center of education policy. Robinson versus Cahill decision has been festering for a while. And Brenda Burns decides that in order to meet the court's mandate in Robinson v. Cahill that he will support tax reform, which will include an income tax, and a major overhaul of the state role in education mm -hmm. um, that you've sort of been outlining, which was relatively minor uh, at, to this point. Uh, what was your reaction, I guess, to this sort of change, sharp change in policy and, I guess, uh, adoption of the ideas that you had been promoting for several years? Well, of course, I was delighted by that. Uh, uh, felt vindicated and was committed to doing everything I could to help. I knew he was in an uphill fight. It, I think, reiterated for me, f for example, the nakedly political uh, motivations that elected officials have because, as you well know, he tried several times to move that through the legislature, and it was a strongly Democratic legislature that his coattails had brought in seemed to have certain obligation. He could not do it. Uh, I can remember on several occasions, see, I had maintained, for reasons to this day I don't quite understand, I had maintained not good relationships, but, but, but communication with the, with the people in the political spectrum that were basically blue collar white ethnics because I come from those, that community, I grew up in that community, and I expressed repeatedly sympathy for at least a plea to understand the situation they were in. And so we did talk a lot. 
And Byrne asked me on a number of occasions to go see that any one of them who might influence the outcome of this debate and argue for the income tax. Do you remember specifically any names? Of well, I remember one of them, <laughs> which, which was a very memorable day. You may recall the only, probably the only independent senator ever elected in New Jersey, in my memory, was Anthony Imperial from Newark who was a, he is a huge racist and uh, avowed Ku Klux Klan person and George Wallace supporter and so forth. And uh, he was a defender of the Italian community in the North Ward against the onslaught of the niggers and I mean, just is unbelievable. And, uh, but he and I had long, serious conversations. He was not the buffoon, by the way, that he, uh, people perceived him to be. I thought he was very dangerous myself. But, he would see me and he would talk to me and so I went to see him one Sunday at his home. He invited me to come to his home and uh, uh, I remember vividly he's living in North Ward, this narrow house and in the back it was all paved concrete. It was just, it was just uh, like, uh, it was a cliche that someone would imagine if you were going to have someone from a you know, blue car community and he had this above ground swimming pool and he was floating in it <laughs> and then he invited me to dinner there were gun racks. I mean, he must have gone to scenery or somewhere and developed his home for me to visit. I did, by the way, he rejected it completely, and so I didn't get anywhere. So I remember that quite vividly. Um, but uh, the other thing I remember about that situation was that after, you may know this, I don't know if it was the second or third time that the legislature rejected the um, income tax. The Chief Justice then was former Governor Hughes, who said, okay, guys, in, in so many words, we're not going to tolerate an unconstitutional system, or we've declared it unconstitutional. Uh, you're going to close these schools. You're not going to run these schools. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I was on the state board at the time. Um, the, uh, uh, the Commissioner of Education then was uh, Fred Burke of the famous Abbott v. Burke uh, decision. And uh, the, commission, the Chief Justice said that the, the uh, State Board of Education shall come together and pass a resolution closing schools. The State Board controls all the public schools. They delegate all of this authority, but in fact, those are all state-controlled schools. <laughs> and he said that if you don't do it, guys, you're all personal contempt of court. And so I can remember this assembling in Trenton. We had about a 30-second meeting where you just passed that resolution. That's all you did. Well, all hell broke loose because I think it was like August, maybe. So the schools were mostly closed at the time, but opening was imminent. I think July 1st. They was it July 1st? Them. Yeah. And uh, all these parents and everybody came roaring into the legislator's office, just as you probably expected and wanted to happen. And they passed that thing. Uh, but that, that then, of course, once it passed, then Byrne got his ratings started, they took a nosedive. And Do you recall back and forth conversation among other members of the state board about how they confronted this uh, order from the court, or did they want uh, independent legal advice, or were they? Nobody said a word. No. They just went and voted. Nobody was going to be in contempt of court. Uh, I was delighted with it, to be perfectly frank, because first of all, I had to get to the point where, well, at least personally, I had to get to the point where the court put enough pressure on. Then the governor had to get to that point, and then the legislator had to get to that point. I knew every one of these things had to be pushed hard before we ever got the income tax and before we ever got the revision of funding, which I thought was absolutely essential. I'm deeply disappointed in Abbott today because of the remedies that the court ordered. That's a whole other discussion. But at that time, I was assuming that the court understood the problems of education in the cities and that aside from demanding that there be funding equity, that they order remedies that were going to address the problem. They did not. They walked away from everything. If you had written the decision, how would it have uh, read? Well, first of all, I would, I would have recognized that the, that the principal reason 
why schools work or don't work has to do with the caliber of teachers that are in those schools and the independence that the teachers have and the authority that the uh, the authority that the uh, administrators have in running those teachers, how they can, the freedom they have to recruit them, the freedom they have to fire them if they're incompetent, the freedom they have to reward effectiveness and productivity and merit, the freedom they have to avoid first, last in, first out downsizing. All of those are industrial union features that the court basically allowed the unions to build into all the, co the collective bargaining agreements, which makes it absolutely certain that the worst schools are going to get the worst teachers and the best schools that don't need the teachers are going to get the best teachers. That's exactly the situation we have. We have highly segregated. The court should have ordered desegregation, among other things, because that would have essentially moved children into school districts that had good teachers and it moved children into environments where the, where the social situation argued for academic achievement, didn't dismiss it and denigrate it. These are all things the court, the court, I'll be blunt with you, in my opinion, the courts progressively on this issue could not find their ass with both hands. They allowed the Education Law Center, which in my judgment is controlled by the teachers union, to bring in their own experts. And the whole business was about preserving the status quo, just putting more money into the way they did it all the time. And that's why we have what we have today, $30 billion later. Um, you can see I get exercised about this time. <laughs> Would another remedy have been uh, ordering county districts? You mean where the children could move within the county? Yes. Right. But the important thing is to basically get rid of that contract. That contract, for example, it's been established by a number of studies done by, by New Teacher Project, the Education Trust Program. They've done this all over the country. They have, they have actually determined by examining the files of every single teacher in uh, Chicago, Cleveland, and Milwaukee. They got, I don't know how they got this, but the state gave them the files of every teacher, personnel files of every teacher in those three cities and all the suburbs around them. And they examined the files. Right now, a highly qualified teacher under No Child Left Behind is highly qualified if they, if, they, if they meet a certain absurd standard. Number one, that they majored in the subject they're teaching. Now, did you major in West Cupcake Normal or in Harvard? And the second is that you're certified to teach. Now, <laughs> what, this, what the project did was to go in and say, what, what elementary school system did you attend? How good was that? What were your grades in that system? Where did you graduate in your high school class? What were your SAT scores? How competitive was the college you attended? What class rank did you have in that college? How did you rank in the teacher examination? In other words, they took a very intense look at the quality of the individual. And they saw something horrifying, that people with that quality were going to the easier positions in the suburbs, and people that were not being accepted in the suburbs, okay, the bottom of the barrel were going into the urban areas. So you had an inverse relationship between need and response. Now you can say, well, why? What does that matter if the, the good teachers were wanting to go to the service? You have to change the environment in the urban areas so that they would want to go there. Teachers have to get paid more, but not universally across the board in this lockstep kind of program that they have. You've got to pay some teachers twice as much, some teachers half as much, and some teachers have to be thrown out before lunch, right out of the building. I mean, you know, and the principal. You, the, 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 the school has to control the budget. The school has to control who comes in, what teachers are hired, how they're compensated, how they're advanced. There's all things like that. That's how you get a good learning environment. In the, in the, and I'm not saying that it will cure overnight, but at least you're putting your best resources and you're unlocking the hands of people who have to administer those schools. Then you'll get results. That's happening around the country.